and welcome to episode two of The Secret Podcast. My name is JM, and joining me in just a minute will be my co-host Burnstyle, as well as a very special guest for this month's episode. When we started putting this podcast together, Burnstyle and I, we did it as something fun to do for us, something to encourage people to look at these puzzles in a way where one could apply their individual talents and skills to be beneficial to the forward progress of the puzzle being solved, perhaps in hopes that before time and nature swallow them all up, another cask may see the light of day through some educational entertainment of our own, or better yet, we might solve the whole puzzle, how it works, what the clues mean. When we started putting this podcast together, we also knew there was a chance of monumental, inexplicable, unsurmountable failure. Like... Leroy Jenkins type failure. Nobody would listen. Those who did would just ridicule us to no end. Well, there was all of that. We've received criticism. We've been mocked and smeared, even threats of lawsuits. But a wise friend once told me, the only time you catch flack is when you're over the target. This month, we have episode two for you. And next month, we'll bring another. We also received a lot of praise from many of you, and we have over 300 downloads and listens to the first episode. We've been added to iTunes. We're glad you're paying attention, and thanks for tuning in. And right now, I'd like to welcome my co-host from the oldest city in the U.S., Mr. Bernstyle. How are you doing, sir? Uh, so far, so good. It's kind of cold here. Yeah, it seems to be cold everywhere in the South. Do you have a good New Year? Everything good? Yeah, everything was really good. We had like a oyster bake we spent a lot of time uh in saint augustine just kind of hanging out it was fun and hopefully we'll get to discuss you had a gpr expedition recently that maybe we'll get to discuss in a future episode we can talk about that just happened over the holiday didn't it we did we spent a good uh good day at the fountain of youth with the gpr we found a lot of interesting things cool well looking forward to hearing about that um right now i'd like to uh also welcome to the show in this discussion that we're going to have about Chicago is a guy who's been working on this hunt for over 30 years, and he's researched all of the cities in question. On the line with us from California is avid treasure hunter and longtime participant in The Secret, Mr. Matt Sparks. Matt, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you guys doing tonight? Well, we're cold. How is it out there? Is the chill hit you yet? Uh, it's, you know, 50, 55. 55 degrees we had a tiny bit of rain yesterday it was in the 60s so you know summer in california it must be tough yep so just a little introduction to uh matt and who he is well first of all what is your handle on q for t so people can have some reference to who you are i am malted falcon on q for t and all kinds of other places online so in the forums if you're one of those people that digs around and reads every forum there is out there you'll find matt's posts probably scattered all over the place a brief history of how you became involved with the hunt you were working at a bookstore in your youth is that right and came across a copy is that how it happened well that's correct i was working at a bookstore in washington dc one of the jobs you do in the bookstore is unpack the new book orders. And the new Bantam book order came in and everybody wanted to unpack the order because there's always cool stuff in the box. I got to it first, open the box, and on top of the box, I remember seeing for the very first time the book, The Secret. I grabbed my copy right then and there. Next time I was up at the register working, I was reading at the same time. I know it's a long time ago, but do you remember how you started out going about trying to figure out what was going on in the book? Actually, the Masquerade book had just come out a couple of years prior, and I had been really trying hard with the Masquerade book and got absolutely nowhere. So when I saw this book, I thought, hey, it's a little closer to home. I can probably do this. And right off, there was no question in my mind that over L's left shoulder meant the Statue of Lincoln in Washington, D.C., which, <laughs> which would put one of the casks near me in Northern Virginia. I'm sure that people have had similar 
experiences when reading it for the first time. We'll talk to Brian and Andy here on the next episode, but they the story with them is that Brian was headed to Philadelphia to go get the Cleveland cask when he set out to go get it. It can be deceiving. How did you finally figure out that there wasn't one in Washington? Probably after about a year. After about a year when the guys found it in Chicago? Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't know. No, that's not how that worked. Nobody knew about the Chicago find for, I would say, 10 years, um, really. I mean, the people in Chicago knew, obviously, and anybody who happened to see that magazine knew. But you got to remember, this predates the internet. You couldn't Google search the secret and see the uh, latest updates. I played with it for a better part of a year when I moved out of uh, Washington, D.C. There was, you know, it was like set it aside. It wasn't until the early 90s when there was a secret group on GeoCities. And that's when I got back into it. And that's when I originally heard somebody in Chicago had found it. The f- most frustrating part about that was there was absolutely no information online about who found it where they found it, just that they found it. It was pretty definite that somebody had found one in Chicago. I mean, at first, everybody was like, uh, I don't believe it, but it became pretty definite pretty quick. There was enough information came out that confirmed it. Still, it was very frustrating. There wasn't anywhere near the amount of information we have now about what the guys found. When you got back into it in the 90s then, how long was it before you figured out that you were now living close to one? At the time, everybody was absolutely sure that certain verses went with certain cities. Now, that's all been turned over. We could actually go back because it happened while I was on Quest for Treasure that I did figure out that the map of Golden Gate Park was smack in the middle of image one. It became obvious at that point that at least the image meant San Francisco. It was over time that various other things popped up. That predated knowing that there was latitude and longitudes in some of the pictures. Just before Quest for Treasure, we figured, you know, I figured out that the map was Golden Gate Park in the picture. And it was just after Q for T that people started putting together other parts of the puzzle, like um, that there were other maps in other pictures and that there were uh, latitude and longitudes in a lot of the images. Robert Fox says that he was one of the first to figure out the longitude latitude. So hopefully we can get some interesting insight from him on how that came about. But let's set the stage here. So it's 2000-ish, early 2000s, and you're kind of back into working on the puzzle part-time. Okay, there's there's wait, there's no part-time. This treasure hut is full-time. You're always thinking about it. I wasn't going to say it. I'm glad you brought it up. I wasn't going to say how much actual hours we put in in a day sometimes working on this stuff, but I'm just, I just wanted someone to say it first. I am ashamed of how much time I've invested into this. Oh, I know how it is, my friend. <laughs> You're working on the hunt. Some of these little things start to come out about eventually people figure out that the images have the longitude and latitude numbers in them and some of the cities start to get figured out and then some of the verses start to get matched up and so on and so forth. There wasn't a lot of information given on Chicago. I guess we can we can move into Chicago here. Um, you'll learn more about Matt as the months go on. I'm sure we'll have him back to discuss other things, but he's got a broad history in this subject. We're glad to have him on to talk about the find in Chicago. So let's just go to the timeline real quick for Chicago. Bernstein, did you have anything you wanted to ask Matt? No, no, you guys pretty much covered it. He's a man of few words, but they're, they mean a lot. Bernstein. <laughs> First of all, I want to apologize to uh, Danny Rosenbach for calling him, I think I called him Dave on the pilot episode. That was totally wrong. I, I just want to say I'm sorry for doing that. The, again, the three uh, individuals who dug up the Chicago cask, Rob Robel, Eric Gasarowski, and Dan Rosenbach are the three guys that did it in 1983. And let's real quickly go to the timeline here. And we'll discuss uh, how this all went down. And this is 
information that, uh, keep in mind, this wasn't known at the time. I don't even think BBEs were around back then. It, it may be pre-BBE or bulletin board, BBS, bulletin board system. I was about to say, BB what? There was a bulletin board in the, uh, I would say, uh, late 80s that did have treasure hunt stuff on it and there was a secret column on there and it was useless it had absolutely no information everything has come a long way we could say okay so we're here it's 1982 the book was published november of 1982 it was about that time that the press releases went out from either bantam or bp publishing there were some articles that appeared in several papers across the country, one of them being the Chicago Tribune. There was this kind of a promo article that came out around November, December of 1982. One of those three guys from Chicago read that article and bought the book. He starts to try to figure the stuff out. Then let's fast forward to February of 1983. Rob, Eric, and Dan dig their first five holes uh, by February of 1983, they're convinced they have the right spot, and they go out to Grand Park, and they put five holes in the ground in the chilling cold of February, or what sounds like it's chilling cold of February, but I looked it up from February 16th through the end of the month in 1983. The temperature was just breaking up to the 40s and 50s, and there was even a 60-degree day, so not so cold outside, but extremely frozen ground, I can attest to that. And it was a landfill. The Grand Park was made out of landfill. So they're digging in landfill in February when it's still pretty frozen. But they still managed to put five holes in the ground without getting arrested or anything bad happening to them. They didn't find anything. They send a letter to Price after digging where they thought they were sure they had the right spot. Some months pass. Now we're in the spring of 1983. All right, they never get a response. Apparently, the letter was never received. Early July of 83, they make a collect phone call to BP's office, long distance. His secretary, which may have been his mother, she's credited in the book as helping. And we, we don't know. She was involved somewhat. She answers the phone, the secretary, and proclaims, there's no treasure in Chicago. And they're not satisfied, so they call back the next day, and they get BP on the phone and they explain where they're digging and why, and BP says to them, you have the answer, I don't see why you can't find the right spot. They go back to Grand Park in July of 83, and they dig a ton of holes in the park, but they don't find it. And then they call BP again, and they beg for the last little clue as the story goes, and BP sends them a snapshot of the burial site. In late July, early August of 1983, they go and dig up the cask. And their solve, this is their solution, as reported by the Tribune, August 9th, 1983. They felt that the objective of figuring it out was matching the, and I'm quoting here, matching the lesser known or disguised landmarks from the city to the paintings and matching that with the verse. I'm not quite sure what what he was meaning by that, but that, that was their, uh, what it was all about. And the, we'll go through these, but I'll just list them off here. For M and B, they had man and beast. And we, we know that old story for Congress. They said it was either the drive or the hotel. We can attest that it's most likely Congress drive. We'll talk about it for R. They actually had railroad. They thought it was the railroad. L was the statue of Lincoln. Of course, central, they solved as Illinois Central Railroad. Brush and Music was the Art Institute and Bandshell. And of course, 10 by 13 were the rows of trees behind the statue of Lincoln. And another quote from the article is, uh, I think it was Eric who said, basically, find a fence and fixture somewhere in the vicinity of that and start digging. So let's start with the 10 by 13 rows of trees behind Lincoln. First of all, I thought there maybe was a video floating around circa 2014 where Eric or Rob placed a book right on the spot uh, where the exact burial location was, but this has been some debate for some time. Somewhere there was a report that in the correspondence between BP and the three guys in Chicago, it was said by BP to account for anything that had been removed. 
And that would almost be a direct tie to him conceding the 10 by 13 clue were the trees. Perhaps the Chicago guys initially told BP the answer to the 10 by 13 were the trees behind Lincoln, and then BP says you have the answer. There's been theories that walking at a 130-degree line from Lincoln using True North and stopping at the fence and fixture intersections pinpoints the exact spot. Some say it's 10 by 13 feet from the fence and the bridge wall. I mean, Matt, what do you think on this one? It's a topic of debate for some time now. Well, I've been to Chicago. I've been to the site. I went in the late 90s. Did you go before they redid the bridge on Jackson? I did. Okay, all right. I went. At that point, I had heard 10 by 13 was the trees and that some of the trees had been removed. When I went there and started counting trees and started counting spaces, it worked out for me. I ended up right next to the uh, fence and fixture. I've been there as well. I posted the pictures on our group a few months ago when I was there of the area, and it's a kind of a little corner. But the intersection exactly, it doesn't put you right in front of that fence and fixture. It kind of, if you're facing it, it puts you a little bit off to the right of where that fence and fixture, or, or the, well, the, the fence post where that is. I mean, you're still in that corner. Did you feel that it was a pinpoint location, the corner of those two tree lines? I did. And you're right. I wasn't lined up with the fixture. I wasn't lined up with the fence post. I was lined up with the trees, and that put me in the corner. And short of being there for the dig, I had to assume I was standing on the spot where it was. When I was there, there were still a bunch of pitted holes in that corner from where those guys had put just a million holes in what it seemed. And it just goes to show you, you can dig a thousand holes and miss the thing by, you know, four inches and think that you didn't make it at all. Burn style, do you have any uh, comment on this? Have you ever thought it was anything different than trees or have you ever entertained any theories about what else it might be? I thought the compass 130 degrees was the most interesting one. I'd... No, I, I always assumed it was the trees. I, like I said, I try to keep things simple. So 10 by 13 trees, 10 by 13, it makes sense to me. I think I want to say the way these have to solve out is it has to basically solve down to a square foot. If you have an area to dig, you're not going to find it unless you have a backhoe. You know, if, you, if you're not digging at a particular point on the soil, you have to move, and trust me, I have, so much dirt. Well, Mark has a backhoe, and he didn't find one either, so I don't know that even a backhoe would be. I think you need a GPR at this point, and you almost need to know what, what kind of a signal it's going to put out to find it. I think this goes back to me and my, my opinion that, that Price was just horrible, horrible at puzzles, because I can see... Finding Lincoln and Grant Park, right? I can see looking over his shoulder and seeing the trees. I can see counting the trees, but I cannot get from the trees to the actual spot that the, the cast was buried. It just, it doesn't make sense to me. It, it seems like it's not at the end of either of the trees. It, it's not at the end of, of 10. It's not at the end of 13. It doesn't really correspond. You can't really pinpoint it. I don't think it, if they hadn't gotten that picture, they would have never found it. I think the this one tree thing, was missing. When you stood on the spot, if you looked basically north, there were nine trees and a, and a spot for another one, not counting where you're standing. And if you looked to the east, there were, I don't remember exactly how many trees there were. There weren't 13, but there was a line of trees with trees missing. You can almost see a shade of that old line. There's three big trees towards the very eastern part of that line where you can kind of make out. Yes. But still, it is a big area. It was a huge area, but the lines intersected where I was standing. Let's assume for a moment, and I have a couple things to say about this. I mean, let's assume for a moment that where Matt was standing, the intersection of 10 by 13 of the trees was the exact pinpoint spot. You would assume that in all of these... He is going to leave us this square location. But the ambiguity of some of these final dig spots in some of these cities is pretty mind-blowing if that's the case. Going back to what I said in the pilot, he did say that some of these were harder than others. There is a difficulty range. I've come to accept that there is a chance that BP was trying to vet these people who were looking for the casts 
by making them contact him. Eventually, if he knew that you were close enough or had figured out enough of the clues, he would help you out. If you were on the wrong track, he wouldn't help you out. That is a possibility. That makes so much more sense to me because all of these puzzles seem to lead you to a spot that's maybe six foot by six foot. And there's no way without knowing the exact spot within that six foot by six foot area that you're going to find something buried two foot in the ground. I mean, it, it's almost impossible. So when you bring in the GPR out to San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> does your guy uh, travel? He does travel. We've got to finish up some stuff in St. Augustine. We were stopped, but that's an, a story for another time. Then we're going to uh, Charleston, and then we'll figure out where to go from there. Well, that sounds good. Hopefully we can get a GPR reading over some of these spots where we suspect that it is. Uh, I can share my GPR uh, readings with you guys and show you the signals that it was creating on the mock cast that we did. But they're, I mean, they're tough to find. I recently visited Brian down in Florida and I, he brought the cask out and let me examine it. And when I held it in my hands, it was very, very small. It's smaller than you think. It can easily sit in the palm of your hand and it's only about five or six inches tall. It's not a huge thing. I can see how easily it could be missed by someone. Matt, do you think that he left uh, an exact spot on all of these, or do you think Chicago and Cleveland were easier? Do you have any opinion as to whether he was trying to vet people, get them to call in? Well, I will agree that he was actually pretty bad at setting up a treasure hunt. He picked various clues that were temporary, wouldn't have been there in a year or so, and he had no idea that this hunt was going to go on for decades. He was hoping, there's no question, he was hoping that people would find these treasures, it would make lots of news, he'd sell lots of books, and he'd shortly come out with the second volume of The Secret. That was the intention, yeah. It was. So it, I'm sure, disappointed him that his clues were just a little bit obtuse for most people. And he was expecting them to be found within the first year. Chicago was close, but I don't even think that was inside the first year. I would assume he was expecting him to be found quicker than that, judging from St. Augustine. Tall grass is a clue. I mean, for God's sakes, Byron, grass gets cut. Tall grass, seriously? <laughs> Take into consideration that he prob most likely did not feel it would go on this long. Masquerade went on for three years. Granted, there was some uh, controversy over the solution and how it came about, but it was three years. It wasn't 35 years. Let's continue to go over this solution here. And some of these things that they had were correct and some were incorrect. We know that Man and Beast is, is an incorrect solve and that it was Mozart and Beethoven. I don't even think that they even started at the icon. We'll get to that in just a second, but Man and Beast was wrong. It was Mozart and Beethoven, which are written in stone above the uh, Chicago Symphony. Congress Drive is most likely the answer to that. Solve R, as we know, is Roosevelt. Uh, L is Lincoln, and the common theme with all the initials is that they're all uh, last names. Well, let me just say, Congress, R for Republican, Lincoln, there's no question this clue resolves to Washington, D.C. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You, you, you should go dig up the mall right now. It actually, 10 by 13, definitely number of tombstones in Arlington Cemetery. Remember, it's over his left shoulder. So, worked on that for a while. How long, how long did you study that? Two years. Wow. How many felonies did you commit digging up? Uh, never dug in Virginia. I never, obviously never found a spot. It's continually baffling how the clues that he put in have become so ambiguous and have not changed. It's, it's become worse with time. We're finding statues in New Orleans that match up to the image that were made in 1992. There's a lot of very strange things that happen with these after the fact. Oh, yeah. There's, there's an amazing picture of Boston. There's a uh, fountain that has a bridge behind it with an arch. The arch is exactly the shape of the arch in the picture, and there's a crack in the bridge that matches the crack in the picture. It's exactly. That was created, you know, 10 years ago. 
Palencar definitely did a good job in capturing the uh, fundamental shapes and aspects of each city, it seems, because uh, more things keep popping up uh, with the same kind of patterns in them in those cities. Uh, okay, moving on to the rest of their solve. Central, they're saying Illinois Central Railroad. Do you guys feel, I wanted to just touch on that real quick. Do you guys feel that that's correct, or do you think Central was more of a uh, locating uh, clue for where you should dig? I would have said it was more of a locating clue. I would think so as well. It says fence and fixture Central 2, T-O-O as in also. Okay, well, except if you stand in a defense and fixture, the Central Railroad line's right there. So, we'll, okay, we'll, we'll assume that, that that one was right as well. Brush and Music, I, the Art Institute and the Band Shell, uh, I can't disagree with that. That makes total sense. It's all in that corner of Grant Park there where Buckingham Fountain is. Find a fence and fixture somewhere in the vicinity and start digging. That's what they said it was all about. First of all, there's a lot of things they missed. All right, J just to, aside from the M and B, I can verify that the M and B were correct because if you look on the right side of the image towards the lower part of it, uh, just above JJP's signature, uh, up and to the right, hanging from a pulley, is a round emblem where you'll see a design in there. Well, that round emblem and that design are on the balconies, on the railings on the balconies, right above the names Mozart and Beethoven. It's pretty much an image verifier to say that's right. And also, when you're standing in that exact spot and you look directly behind you, then you see the Lady of the Great Lakes Fountain, which is one of the three highlighted objects inside the image. They definitely miss that. I don't think they miss the water tower, but I think they miss the point of the water tower. Matt, one of the things that you've come up with in your hunt for figuring this puzzle out is that each one of these has an icon in it, and there's a point to that icon. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Originally, we looked at the pictures, and there's no question that's the Chicago Water Tower. This picture obviously can't go with that verse because the verse is Washington, D.C., and this picture is obviously Chicago. From day one, there was no question this was a Chicago picture. I uh, had been working very hard on a San Francisco solve and getting absolutely nowhere. I dug many places. I mean, obviously on the picture number one, there is a map of Golden Gate Park. The cask must be somewhere in Golden Gate Park. Yep, that's absolutely it. With permission and help even from the, the maintenance guys in Golden Gate Park, I searched a lot of places in Golden Gate Park, dug a lot of holes, gotten what I thought was a perfect solve and it didn't pan out. And so I figured it's time to start over from the beginning. And so I thought I will pay attention to how Chicago worked and I will figure out what the methodology is in Chicago. At one point I was like, okay, let's see if I can learn something about the water tower. And I was on the Terra server, which predated Google Maps. No, the satellite images. Satellite images. I was looking at Chicago and I was on the Chicago water tower and I thought, um, okay, there's the water tower. I obviously don't have any clue what this is supposed to mean. Let me go look where I know the cask was found. And so I started scrolling. I realized that I didn't have to scroll left or right. I only had to scroll straight down and it occurred to me, I started at the water tower and I went straight down one street, Michigan Avenue, and I just followed it until I got to Grant Park, until I got to the statue of the, the Bowman. At that point, I had a sort of an epiphany, hey, I went from one picture to the cast site with no turns. And at that point, Cleveland had been found and it was a new find. I thought, let me double check. And so I went to the Cleveland image 
And I was not at all familiar with a Cleveland or the Cleveland image. And I opened up the Cleveland image. I found what looked to me to be the Chicago water tower upside down in the Cleveland image. And I was like, that's a thing. A little research on quest for treasure found out that that's the Cleveland terminal tower. We went to the Terra server at that point, found the uh, Cleveland uh, terminal tower, and I found the street that the Cleveland terminal tower was on, which I think was Euclid. I started scrolling down Euclid, and sure enough, without any turns, I hit the park. Right. I went right to the park where the cask was found in Cleveland. I mean, I, there was it's a huge park, and I was on the other side of the park, but that was enough for me. So you said, aha, and we, me and you have had a little debate over whether it was Euclid or St. Clair. We'll get to that with Brian and Andy, and I'll make sure to bring up your part of it as well. Uh, didn't you say you even ran into a, when you hit the turn to go towards the cask area, that you saw there was a big triangle in neon or something like that? Way down the line, we're talking years later, because now we're on uh, Google Maps with Google Street View. I was able to make the trip down using Google Street View. And when you get to the point where you have to turn in Cleveland, there's a big sign that says the Triangle Apartments or the Triangle Plaza. And there's a big triangle that matches the shape of the triangle in the sphere on the Cleveland picture. So that made me think, okay, there's an icon in these two pictures. You start at the icon, you go down one street, you get to another picture in or another image in the picture, and that's where you turn. It works for Chicago. You go from the water tower, you go down Michigan Avenue till you see the statue of the Bowman, you turn. Right, right. and we found out that it actually works in every single one of these puzzles with the exception of the puzzles that don't give you an icon. and Except St. Augustine. Also, the Outer Banks, Roanoke Island, uh, Fort Raleigh, there's not an icon that's given in the image, but it's given in the verse. Sticking back to Chicago, Matt figures out that there's an icon to start at in each one of these. So if you start, and th this is found out after the guys dug this up. So again, it just reinforces the theory that I hate that Bernstein is stuck on, which is you don't, these, the guy was terrible at making a puzzle and you don't need to figure all this stuff out to find the cask. And you may be right. Somewhere in there, I think he was trying to make a good puzzle. Maybe he failed, but there's just too much evidence. I think he was trying too hard and that's what caused him to be a bad puzzle maker. It could be. It could be. There's too much evidence of other things going on within the scope of these puzzles. But we can say for sure that there are some things that are pretty clear, which is he's giving you a city by giving you the location of a city in the images, and that allows you to match the verse to the image. Once you know the city, you can relate the things that are going on in the verse to the city, which Chicago is interesting because... There's nothing specific. Like you said, Matt, you were in Washington looking for it, and there's nothing totally specific in that verse per se that you can read that and say, well, this is Chicago. Unless maybe you lived there and you knew, uh, were familiar with the Grant Park area and the streets in that area and such. But w w was there any, do you guys, I'll just put this out there. Was there any indication that that verse was Chicago? I think they uh, basically jumped to the middle of the puzzle. They uh, recognized their local Lincoln. They realized Congress was near Lincoln. That uh, basically led them to Grant Park. I think they knew to go to Grant Park before they were sure um, about anything else. It's obviously because it's demonstrated you can jump into the middle of a solution here. You don't have to solve it from the very beginning. Part of the reason why over time this search has become so uh, mired in strange theories and weird, 
you, you can jump right in the middle, find a cask, and never know how to actually complete the puzzle. It's pretty confusing when you can do that and you don't know what's going on, but now we know that there was an icon to the park path that you would take, and we know that we keep finding the same thing in all of the others. So the icon to park path was Michigan Avenue from the water tower all the way to where you start seeing the clues. Really, the majority of the clues in the verse start when you get to the highlighted fountain, the Lady of the Great Lakes statue, where M and B are, and that's pretty much where it starts. You take that path down Michigan Avenue, you get to the area where the Symphony Center is and the Great Lakes Lady of the Great Lakes statue is, and then at that point, you're standing maybe... A hundred yards from the cask, would you say, Matt? From that corner? Um, I can tell you exactly. Let me zoom in right here, and you would be basically 500 feet. 500 feet. So you're at that point where he's starting you in the verse. You're 500 feet away from where the burial site is. Yet he takes you all the way down Michigan Avenue, which is like four miles. Well, it's four miles from the water tower to this area. But yep. Yeah, so then when you get to this area, he takes you down three blocks away from the cask. He walk, walks you right by it. You walk right by Jackson. You keep going down to Congress Drive, where you encounter Roosevelt University, and you encounter the Congress Hotel, Congress Drive, the Statue of the Bowman. There's a few other image matches. There's a sculpture that's in the median of Congress Drive as it proceeds to go into Grant Park right there, which is uh, mimicked by the lines in the neck at the bottom of the image there. For a long can... time, I thought that the uh, the medallion that's hanging to the right of the gnome was Buckingham Fountain in Grant Park, but it's definitely, like you said, the decoration on the balcony above M&B. It seems in a lot of these, the kind of feel of the city is encompassed in a lot of the things JJP puts in these images. In St. Augustine, there's a number of things that you being a local resident there can point out about that specific image and some of the clues down there that if you're not local, you wouldn't know. Is Do you find that to be true? I found that to be true in Milwaukee. Yes, uh, and there, there's a lot of stuff in that puzzle that if you weren't from around there, especially if you didn't grow up around St. Augustine in the 80s, you'd never know. Like, the painting looks like a pile of rocks, unless you lived in St. Augustine in the 80s. And some of those rocks make a lot of sense. There's a number of clues in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that people would not have known about. One, because they're gone now. I was able to dig up some pictures of them and, and kind of point them out and match them up. There certainly is a lot of knowledge that is local when it comes down to certain aspects of these puzzles. There's a lot of general clues, but then there's a lot of clues that seem to maybe have a different meaning or make sense in a different way if you're local and you know about what he's talking about ahead of time. Do you think that the Chicago Solve, when it was printed, and I mean the Cleveland Solve for that matter, Cleveland had a little more information. Neither one of them really laid out a, a solid method of, hey, this is how you solve this puzzle. Do you think that the solve hurt the forward progress of the hunt because of what they missed and how they kind of jumped in the middle? Then we all assume that this is the way you solve the puzzle when they kind of stumbled onto it, in a, in a sense. They didn't stumble onto it. They found solved a lot of clues, but they jumped into the middle of it and never completed the full puzzle. It went kind of fast, and that information, when that was put out there, did it hurt the hunt? Did it hurt the forward progress? Did it make it harder to figure these things out? Uh, I don't I don't think it it hurt because, like what was said earlier, nobody really knew it was solved for 10 years. Uh, and then even after that, everybody was treating each puzzle in, in its own certain little way. So I don't think anybody was thinking there was a methodology at all for the puzzles. I think everybody thought each individual puzzle is unique uh, and it should be solved in a unique way. Until, I, I don't think you can really get your head around what we're talking about, about each of them being their own individual thing and until you study all of them individually. Um, there's a certain amount of stuff 
that works in every single one of them. There's an icon in every single one of them. There's a city given in every single image. There is a path that you can take. Most of the time, it's called out uh, by a riddle in the verse that gives you the name of a street, like it does in Milwaukee, like it does in other cities. There are a certain amount of things that work in all of them to get you to the park. And then once you're in the park, once you start to get close, everything changes dramatically. It changes into something that is unique to each individual puzzle, or there may be coincidences going on with pairs of the puzzles, two, diff two cities acting in tandem in certain ways. Not mutually exclusive to each other to finding the city's cast, I'm just saying there's a lot of coincidences happening in pairs of them. Guys, knowing what we know about where the cask was buried and all the changes that have taken place to the area of Grant Park in Chicago, if that cask were still in the ground today and only Cleveland had come out of the ground in 2004, what do you guys think the chances are of someone finding that cast today? There'd be a good chance it would be found. Yeah, again, we, we lost a whole bunch of landmarks, uh, that, which were the trees, uh, but everything else is still there. Oh, we lost landmarks. The bridge has been redone. That didn't affect the cast site. The fixture was removed. The electrical fixture that was on the bridge isn't there anymore. The halo going over the two fence posts is gone. We have pictures of the fixture. I mean, so, well, you are, I guess we wouldn't have pictures of the fixture if it had never been found. The halo was gone, except that if you go up to the fence, you can still see where the halo was broken off. And there's a bend in one of the, on the fence post where the cask was buried, that one that's in that corner, the fence post is bent slightly on one side, mm -hmm. and that's reflected in the drawing. And it's like still like that in real life. So that there is that, but I'm just saying there is a lot of missing information from that puzzle today. If we didn't know, had no clue what L was or M and B or any of that, and we're still looking at it today, and we only had Cleveland to look at. Well, honestly, in San Francisco, we are that close. <laughs> we still can't find it. We've got exact image matches. We have, you know, we have it down to within 100 square yards of where it was. But it's changed too much. Burnstyle, what do you think? I think uh, it would have been pretty easy to find Grant Park. Even with the trees missing? Even with the trees missing. The clues would lead you to Grant Park. But then I think someone would dig every square inch of Grant Park before they'd find it because the trees are missing and because the fixture's missing and because the arch is missing. I don't know, guys. We're, we're up against Sova. We're up against time. We're up against the man. <laughs> are we going to get one of these out of the ground? We're going to need GPR. We're going to need... It's, it's really a struggle trying to get these out of the ground, even, even when you know where one is. You don't think there'd be any problem getting it out? I, I disagree. I think it would be very hard to find that one today if, if people were looking for it. I, I think you're right. I think they would find Grant Park. Eventually, they would find, they would find that area. Uh, they would certainly find the Bowman. Uh, but I don't know if they would be able to dig up the cast. There'd be no help, that's for sure. They wouldn't get a picture. Well, it's, it, it's important to remember that even with the photo that you know, BP provided, showing where the where the thing was buried they dug a hole there and almost missed the cask right they're hard to find they're very hard to find pet peeve of mine you know i have a solution for san francisco i have a solution for uh montreal uh no you don't because you don't have a cask so you know i have a wild idea yeah that's that's closer so until we find a third cask I think it's arguable that every single one was very different. Maybe we just happened to get the Cleveland and the Chicago that are similar. We need more data before we can extrapolate further. On the cask, on the underside of the lid, there was a clock. And I've tried to find out if the clock in the image of Chicago, the clock in the image of Cleveland matches the clock on their particular face, but I've never been able to quite figure that out. 
burn style, you have any opinion as to um, what that stuff is for and anything that is in Chicago that could help us figure it out? I have I have absolutely no opinion of what they're for because I, I can't figure it out either. I've, I've thought about it. I've thought about it and thought about it. I can't. I, I, no, no idea. I want to say the uh, the Cleveland cast was so destroyed that they could read the time on the on the lid, right? So yeah. We won't, we won't really know if that matched. I witnessed uh, Brian's box of pieces of the lid, and it's quite an undertaking to try and put that back together. It's probably 30 or 40 pieces. I, I volunteer. I volunteered. I told him, send it to me. I'll put it back together for you. But I don't think he wanted to go that far from Cleveland. I think we have to ascertain, though, that the the time on the clock face on Cleveland would be what? Was it three? Would it be three o'clock? It could be as simple as uh, BP gets a box of casks and, okay, I'm flying out to Cleveland now. Let me figure out which cask I'm supposed to grab. Yeah, he's got to have a way of numbering them, so maybe that's it. Oh, come on. Yeah, it might have absolutely nothing to do with the solve. Sometimes simple answers are the correct answers. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they are. But why go through all the trouble of putting those things in all those paintings? He was putting in clues. He had, Palancar had a, an amalgamation of maps and photos and probably notes from Byron of things that he had to put into the image. And the way that we understood Byron to work was he kind of gave everybody their own tasks and let them run with it, and he kind of directed from afar. JJP is doing all this where he's incorporating all these things, and then on top of that, on top of that, Byron's going to call him and say, hey, listen, I need to have a way that I know which one of these casts go in which one of these holes. So can you put in these images, these flowers and these gemstones in somewhere in there, and we'll we'll go to press with it like that too. We'll publish it, and maybe people will think it's a clue. I don't know. I just can't buy. I don't think that that's the reason. I think that there's a specific thing going on, and it, it, it's been showed that you can marry or wed each image in a way that I've discussed with both of you in the past, where you can draw that line, and that line denotes a specific clue inside that uh, that, that painting. That seems to work. I mean, do you think that that was intended? That is how masquerade works. When you told me about that a little while back, I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. And then we ran the lines for Chicago. We ran the lines for Cleveland. I was like, yeah, that's pretty good. And then we ran the line for San Francisco. And I was like, hey, you might be onto something. So it remains to be seen. It is something to think about. Perhaps there is uh, yet more to find in these images. There, perhaps there are more puzzles to do and solve. We know that there's at least one more Rebus-type puzzle that needs to be uh, decoded and solved in one of the images. As far as Chicago, pretty straightforward. Go from the water tower. Start at your starting point. Once you find the city, you go there. The only big question is... Once you find the icon, how do you know which way to go on the path? There's two ways you could go on, on Michigan Avenue. I'm sure you'll hit a park if you walk the other way, too. That was, that was my original theory. You face the iconic image like it's shown in the picture, and you go the direction that the main character in the image is looking. And that seems to work, right? Yes, it does. Cleveland's easy for me. I know we're arguing about the actual street, uh, but the act, the street that's right in front of the tower is a circle, and you can leave the circle at multiple places. But the street that's, I think it is, it's a one-way street. You don't have a choice. You know, the only reason I'm stuck on on. The other street is because I found a, a way that I can say, okay, well, he's calling out a street here, so this is what this means. But regardless, perhaps that is the other part of it. You look at the image from the perspective, which shouldn't be lost, from the perspective that it's painted in the image, and then you walk the way that the, uh, the character is facing in the image, and that's how you start off. And that does seem to work. It's pretty clear. You start at the water tower. You walk down Michigan Avenue about three miles. 
Uh, Milwaukee works the same way. You walk about three miles from the Juno statue before you find the staircase. So you come down Michigan Avenue, and then you get to the Symphony Center. You see your image matches. Your verse confirms everything. Your patterns from the image found on the railing confirm M and B. The statue confirms you're in the right spot. You keep going. You confirm the Bowman. Everything's just lines up right in place. Seems easy once it's been solved and pointed out. I don't think there's anything new we can talk about other than the few things that those guys missed. The fact that you do start somewhere. Uh, there's some image indicators above M and B that they missed out on. We still don't know why the, the highlighted objects in the images, we still don't know what those are for. I have some suspicions. My only opinion is completely contradictory to your guys is the positions don't matter. You can walk whichever direction you want from the water tower, but only one way will you end at Congress. Well, that's true, yeah. You walk whichever way you want, but only one direction will give you the rest of the clues. Well, that is true. That is true. You can only walk one way down Wells Street to hit City Hall. If you go the other way, you're not going to find it. I'd have to be really careful there because, you know, the clues can be applied in so many different cities. You know, it's <laughs> it's like, I don't know how he did it, but there are image matches everywhere. There are verse matches that fit, you know, here in the city over there and a city that absolutely no way has a cask in it. I hope he had it a little more instructional that uh, you should be able to figure it out. Yeah, though. Yeah, no, Price, he was he was an awesome author. He was a horrible puzzle maker. And that's why so many things can be matched in so many different cities. He just didn't use enough unique things. And maybe it's because he didn't know enough unique information about each city. You know, who knows? What can we learn from Chicago? Let's talk about that for a second. What we do know is we learn that he does play these little games in the verse where he used uh, letters, just single letters as an abbreviation for something, and then we know he does it again in the New York verse. So we learned that he's playing some games in the verse. We learned pretty clearly that there's an icon and coordinates uh, in the Chicago image. They're very close to each other. So you learn, you ascertain those two facts about uh, how to solve these things from that. Uh, anything else that we get that's fundamental knowledge uh, from knowing the solve? We know that the image, the picture, contains images of things you can see when you're standing on the cask site. Now, do you think that because Chicago's clues are so uh, close by each other, uh, aside from the water tower being a few miles away, I'll tell you right now, when I was standing there, I couldn't see all of the clues. I could see a few of them. I definitely couldn't see M&B or any of the stuff that was beyond the bridge. I could see the Congress Hotel. I could see the Bowman. Uh, I could see Lincoln and a few other things. But my question is, do you feel that when you're standing on the dig site, that it's a uh, sort of a rule that you need to see a certain amount of things? Or do you think those image confirmations are just there to confirm things that he's clues that he's giving you in the verse that you've solved them right? When you look at Chicago, uh, the verse basically is contained in, you know, 500 square feet. When you look at Cleveland, it's even less space that contains everything in the verse. That might be a rule of thumb that the verse only incorporates, you know, the, the treasure ground, so to speak, is a very small area. I think in the ones that I have explored heavily, it works that when you are standing on the treasure ground, you can see a large amount of the things mentioned in the verse. Okay. Is there anywhere in St. Augustine, Burnstyle, that you can stand and see uh, many of the things mentioned in the verse, maybe even some image matches, one spot? There are a few, um, and we've gone over them with GPRs. Like that. So, 
I do want to point out one thing though. In the last month or so, somebody has posted a solution to uh, the wiki for St. Augustine. It was out. It was an outrageously. It was a great solution. Something I had never even thought of. And I tried to get in touch with the person who posted it, but they didn't give him any credit. So I don't. I don't know who submitted this solution. Uh, no, not on the wiki. <laughs> They didn't give him credit. When, what do you mean? When when we had when we had the GPR out there, we we checked that solution and we went all through. Uh, the the solution was you have to stand in a in a part of essentially uh, like midway between two driveways, uh, like an arching driveway, and you stand in the arch and you have to line up an hourglass fountain with the planetarium, and you literally look over some tall grass or what used to be tall grass, uh, a green picket fence look through a fountain and you see the planetarium. It was a beautiful solution. Uh, we checked it with the GPR. We checked the entire area. There was nothing there. But uh, like I said, I tried to get in touch with that person. And if that person ever wants uh, a partner, you should get in touch with me and I'll, I'll, I'll be sure. Uh, I'd love to go out to the thought of you. Nothing but shameless self-promotion from Burnstyle on the podcast this month, ladies and gentlemen. All right. I'm sure that that person will be happy to know that somebody actually checked the spot. And the most that gets done on the wiki is pontification, it seems. And, we, you know, we have Matt on the line. Uh, sh should we uh, discuss a little bit about the wiki? I'm just curious, and I, I won't take this too far, and we, we don't need to uh, get too trash-talky on here just yet. Matt, what was the information that was taken down that you had up there? I know in the past, now, I wasn't a part of the wiki. I, I only used it for reference, for an image reference mainly. But you've been around this hunt for a long time. I know I made some claims on the last episode, and some people think maybe they're unfounded, or some people agree with what I said. But why don't we lend a little background to what I said so that it has some sort of uh, basis in fact from someone who was there. When that wiki page came up, it was a very, from my understanding, it was a very communal, all-for-one based thing. When the wiki started, it was a wiki. Anybody could add anything. It got updated a little bit at first. I put a bunch of stuff on. I was one of the original contributors to the wiki. At one point or another, the original wiki creator decided to bow out. The wiki was taken over. The person who took over the wiki, not going to name names or anything, reorganized the wiki and their theories and their solutions are presented as fact and definite and anything that doesn't match their theories or ideas is moved way down or actually removed from the wiki. And there was a rather humorous point where I was putting my stuff up, it was being taken down. I was putting my stuff up, it was being taken down. Finally, I just pulled all my stuff off the wiki. Uh, now, the, the, there is one good reason to go to the wiki. The wiki is the easiest place to get the high-res pictures uh, online if you want to look at them and they're all there most of the uh, stuff you got to take with a grain of salt that's presented as solutions it's not solutions it's presented as we know this and we know that when we don't it's somebody's idea so for new people coming to the hunt they go on the uh, wiki and they read that stuff and they say, okay, I know, I now know everything there is I need to know about this hunt. They don't. They need, they know about somebody's opinions about the hunt and they aren't going and learning more. I know it's really hard to go to Quest for Treasure and read the thousands of pages that are there, but there's so much more information than's actually on the wiki. There's a lot of stuff on the wiki that's presented as fact that's just straight up wrong. All the good stuff that happened on the wiki happened before this this takeover. Like, one of the, the great things about it, uh, because it's not all bad, there's good points to having the, the page up there. One of the good points is that whoever set up the images, and, you know, maybe Niles did this, maybe he didn't. Niels, whatever, however you pronounce it, maybe Niels did this, maybe he didn't. 
the graph on the one side, the numbers and the letters, which allow you to easily uh, reference something you see in the image. That's primarily what I use that site for. It, it, like you said, it's the place to go and get high-res images, uh, high-res versions of the images, and it's also a good place to go to get some of the old news articles and some of the old facts that have been collected on the hunt. So there are some good things about it, but like you said, you have to take it with a grain of salt. It's these kinds of things that I think specifically hurt the hunt because, and you know, not just the wiki, but you're gonna ha you're gonna see an episode of Expedition Unknown on January 17th, where Josh Gates is gonna point out to James Renner that he feels the lion's face on the Lions Bridge in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, is a match to the. Uh, woman in the image. Now, this is not new information. This, I think, 421 had put a, years and years ago a request that somebody dig out in front of that lion. This is not new information. It's nothing that is surprising to any of us in the know. We've we've all read that post and the several posts where it's that people talk about that. I've stood in front of that lion and I've ran a camera down a hole live on Facebook for all of you to show it to demonstrate a new toy that I had I mean it's not a new solve yet you'll see James Renner stand there and say well this is the first I've ever heard I think you're the first one that's ever figured this out and these two guys are on a major network TV show spreading this information as fact and I think that's what the wiki has done in a sense too is that it's made this false interpretation of what's going on and it's given credit to people who, who don't deserve the credit. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right there. It's a stumbling block. The Expedition Unknown episode is going to be a stumbling block. The wiki uh, being taken over by someone and, and those theories being forced on people is a stumbling block. Another good reason to read the Quest for Treasure forums is you can see the evolution in real time. Everything's stamped and dated. And you'll also find those links in there to the, uh, the PDF of the complete book and the high-res images links are somewhere on the Quest for Treasure forums, I know, because that's where I, I downloaded them myself. Yeah, I don't, I don't have an opinion on the wiki because I'm apparently not allowed to have an account there. So <laughs> I, I'm putting a request. <laughs> I, I, was, I was kicked <laughs> off also. Um, I will say that there are uh, super high-res scans that are color-corrected and from what I understand match the book on the wiki in the comments of the the florida painting someone made really really good high res scans and just posted them as a whole so if anybody doesn't have those that's a good place all to right good good point there from burn style well we have reached the end of time on this month's edition of the secret podcast i want to thank matt sparks for joining us and discussing some of the aspects of the chicago solve there is a lot of history on this particular find since it happened in 1983, and some of the references made during our discussion might not be totally clear to all of you, especially if you're new to the secret. However, there are plenty of pages of forums dating back to 2004 for you to read if you're really interested in examining the finer points of the debate. Also, we do have a Facebook page now, courtesy of Burnstyle. If you'd like to interact with the team, or send us your questions to debate on air, you can find us there under Shh, The Secret Podcast. That's S as in Sam, Triple H, like the wrestler, and then The Secret Podcast. Just do a search and you'll be able to find it. Next week, we will have Brian Zinn and Andy Abrams to discuss Cleveland, and Matt Sparks may also join us for a portion of that episode as well. On behalf of Burnstyle, this is JM. You take care now. Tune in next time for another edition of Shh, a secret podcast with your hosts, JM and Bernstein, available on iTunes. That's good to be.